Last month, we revisited some cool British singles released in May 1966. Now, it's time to do the same with June of that year. And June 1966 was a particularly great month for singles. So, without further ado, let's begin. June 1966 saw the release of a new Beatles single. The Fab Four had been absent from the recording scene during the first half of 1966, and music kept evolving and changing at an incredibly fast pace. But this single proves that the Beatles were very aware of what was happening in the music scene. The A-side, Paperback Writer, was an excellent song which featured a powerful Yardbird-style riff and complex harmonies influenced by the Beach Boys. In an interview several years later, McCartney said, Before that, we had been influenced by Smokey Robinson and the Miracles, but at this point, it was the Beach Boys. Paperback writer is a nod to them, and to the idea that everyone wants to write a novel. Several singles released during the first half of 1966 saw bands experimenting with Indian influences and Eastern melodies. The Beatles had already pioneered the use of the sitar in December 1965 with the song Norwegian Wood. But the melody of the song was still deeply rooted in Western music. So Rain, the B-side of the single, was the first time that the Beatles openly experimented with Eastern melodies. Rain was an excellent song and probably one of the greatest B-sides that the Beatles ever released. The song made innovative use of studio tricks such as backward tapes. The melody maker wrote, From the pen of John and Paul, they subtly follow the trend towards Indian pop, using wailing harmony and dipping bass lines. A very swinging track with a lot of impact, some vicious sounds, and almost disconcerting vocal harmonies. Certainly, right up to Beatles standing. And needless to say, a huge hit. The single reached number one in both the UK and the States. June 1966 also saw the release of one of the greatest mod singles of the 60s. Making Time was the debut single by The Creation, and it was produced by Shel Talmy, who had already produced several hits for groups like The Kinks and The Who. The song featured all the elements that defined the unique guitar style of Eddie Phillips, attacking the guitar with a violin bow and overdriving his amp in order to get that droning feedback effect. The single got excellent reviews in the press, with most reviewers agreeing that the song was bound to become a huge hit. Record Mirror wrote, New group, but worth tipping for the energy, catchiness, and general drama of this mid-tempo belter. Fair enough group vocal, good beat, and some interesting novel sounds created by violin bow on lead guitar. The guitar figures are exceptional. Watch this one closely, it's good. The song got a decent amount of airplay on pirate radio stations, and the press published several ads promoting the single. The music papers also wrote several articles about the creation, and there was even some controversy regarding the name of the group. Lord Hill of Luton, head of the Independent Television Authority, told the press that the name of the band was blasphemous. But despite the quality of the song and the press attention, the single stalled at number 49. Kinks released one of their greatest and most successful singles in June 1966. Sunny Afternoon had a strong music hall flavor, and it presented a departure from their earlier hits, a departure which already started with their previous single, Dedicated Follower of Fashion. The melody maker wrote, Strange Newey composed by Leader Ray Davies, in a slightly raw loving spoonful style. Some might find the length and repetitiveness of this disc a bit too much. But its lazy atmosphere should certainly catch on with Summer on the Way. Should be a very big hit. The B-side was an excellent defiant anthem about non-conformity. I'm not like everybody else. I'm not like everybody else. The song became a favorite among fans of the band, and it has appeared on several Kinks compilations. The single was a huge success, 
It reached number one in the UK and remained there for three weeks. In the States, it peaked at number 14. And the single also became a top 10 hit in Australia, Canada, and in several European countries. You pass by, my pulse starts beating fast. I Must Be Mad by The Craig is one of those singles which meant nothing in the charts when it was originally released, but is now considered a cult classic from that period. The song has appeared on several compilations over the years, and it was even featured on the second Nuggets box set. The band featured a 16-year-old Carl Palmer on drums, who reached bigger success years later with Emerson, Lake and Palmer. The crude and high-energy sound of the song was quite ahead of its time. It starts off with an effective guitar and bass riff with bluesy vocals, and it gradually builds up in tension until it reaches the climax of the song. In an interview several years later, lead singer and composer Jeff Brown said, The song was produced by Larry Page, and it was recorded live in one take. It was a psychedelic storm of sound that really built up to a frenzy, with some great drumming and a massive one-note riff. The record was voted by an Observer poll, only second to Arnold Lane by Pink Floyd, as the greatest psychedelic single of the 60s. When we did that one-take recording, we never could have guessed that it would remain around for posterity. June 1966 also saw the release of another single which meant nothing in the charts at the time but is now regarded as a proto-punk classic from that era. Just like the previous single by The Craig, Save My Soul by Wimple Winch has also appeared in several compilations over the years. This was the group's second 45 and one of the most aggressive singles of 1966. Wimple Winch were the house band at a club in Stockport called The Sinking Ship, which was run by their manager Mike Carr. The single was immensely popular locally when it was originally released. But despite being listed as a climber by Radio London, the song was not successful nationally. A press release from that period stated, The powerful raw sounding Save My Soul, released on June 17, has caused a tremendous reaction wherever they have performed it. These two singles by The Craig and Wimple Winch failed to chart, but June 1966 also saw the release of some very commercially successful singles. Bus Stop by The Hollies was written by future 10cc member Graham Gouldman. The songwriter had already written another hit for The Hollies, Look Through Any Window. The press asked Gouldman about the song. Gouldman said, I wasn't too sure about Bus Stop because it is a bit more complex than the others I've done. My father actually helped me with Bus Stop. He's a writer in his spare time but he could easily be a professional. He's had a play of his own on television. But he suggested an idea about an affair at a bus stop. So I got down to it. He gave me ideas for the verse. Gouldman, who was working at a men's outfitters at the time, finished the song while riding to work on the bus. Penny Valentine wrote, Written by Graham Goldman, this opens with some gorgeous guitar work and then goes into a rather pretty song about a love affair, blooming under the confines of an umbrella. The Hollies make everything sound so easy on their records, that I'm not really completely knocked out, but therein lies their cleverness. Alan's singing is very nice and the harmonies are as good as ever, and of course, it will be a hit. The single was indeed a hit. It reached number 5 in both the UK and the US. It was also a top 5 hit in several European countries and it reached number 2 in Australia and number 1 in Canada. After several years playing in clubs and releasing singles without much success, Chris Farlow finally topped the charts with this cover of Out of Time by the Rolling Stones. The single, which was produced by Mick Jagger, was quite different from the Stones version. The original Stones version was released two months before on the album Aftermath, but their version didn't feature a string arrangement. 
Instead, the melody was played by Brian Jones with marimba. Farlow's version featured a new backing track with a string section arranged by Arthur Greenslade. Prior to Farlow entering the studio, Jagger recorded a guide vocal track for Farlow, which was included later in 1975 on the rarities compilation Metamorphosis. This string version of the song with Jagger on vocals enjoyed a bit of a revival a few years ago when it was included on the soundtrack of Once Upon a Time in Hollywood by Quentin Tarantino. Farlow's version of the song got great reviews in the press. Penny Valentine wrote, This is a fantastic thing. Having never really gone overboard for Chris before, all I can say now is that I bow before a superior force. This is my favorite Stones LP track. When the strings swept along, I just collapsed and remained in a happy stupor for the rest of the record. I love the arrangement, and I wouldn't be at all surprised if it got to number one. Penny Valentine was right in her prediction. The single reached number one in the UK and it was also a top 10 hit in Canada, Australia, New Zealand, Germany, and the Netherlands. Future T-Rex leader Mark Bolan released his second single in June 1966. His first single, The Wizard, had been released in November 1965. That first single was more akin to the sort of stuff that Dylan and Donovan were doing at the time. This second single, on the other hand, saw Bolan going for a more guitar-oriented rock approach. The single got mostly positive reviews in the press. Record Mirror wrote, Best yet from the writer-singer. More powerful, well-warded, fastish tempo, and all in backing sounds. Given plugs, it should do very well. Despite the good reviews, the single failed to chart. Bolan would still have to wait a few years before success knocked on his door. Everywhere I go, people laugh at me. I'm coming down, babe. I'm coming down. This is one of the most bizarre singles released in June 1966. Just looking at the titles, it's easy to guess that both sides were about LSD. This single would probably have been very controversial if it wasn't for the fact that nobody seemed to care about it. In fact, it wasn't even reviewed in the press. But the story behind the single is even more bizarre. Spider's real name was James Barber. James Barber was PJ Proby's hairstylist. On one of his many trips to England, American producer Kim Fowley befriended the hairdresser, christened him Spider, and recorded this single with him. Later in 1968, Barber formed a band called Chrysalis, and the group released an album which was praised by Frank Zappa in several press interviews. Barber eventually became part of Zappa's circle of friends, and his speaking voice can be heard on several Mothers of Invention albums from that era. He is even mentioned on the liner notes of the album We're Only In It For The Money. The Spider single went completely unnoticed, but it was actually quite good. The A-side sounded like a psychedelic Bob Dylan after an acid trip. And the B-side was an odd mixture of early psychedelia and jazz. Go blow your mind. Go blow your mind. And Spider probably still found time to give Proby a good haircut. Or maybe not. After the enormous success of their single Hold Tight, which reached number 4 in early 1966, Dave D. Dozy and Company released their follow-up disc in June. The structure of the song followed pretty much the same pattern as their previous hit. It featured a prominent fuzz guitar and the same drum beat as Satisfaction by the Rolling Stones. Despite the lack of new ideas, the song was so catchy that it was bound to become a hit. Record Mirror wrote, The boys invariably get something catchy going. Here, it's an opening instrumentally with a repetitive beat. Another good vocal arrangement and the song stands up in any company. A definite hit. 
The song was indeed a hit. It reached number 10 in Britain and number 3 in Germany, where the band was incredibly popular. The Downliners Sect was one of many British bands who never achieved the success they deserved. The group released a string of great singles between 1964 and 1966, and their brand of tough and aggressive rhythm and blues was very popular in clubs all over Britain, but chart success always seemed to elude them. Glendora was a cover of a song that had been performed in the 50s by artists such as Perry Como and Jack Lewis, although it's almost hard to believe that this slice of fuzz guitar madness was the same easy listening song that Perry Como performed in the 50s. I'm in love with a darling named Glendora. Record Mirror wrote, This may prove to be the sex's most commercial single yet. Strong vocal frontline and intriguing moments instrumentally. Good beat. The single failed to chart. This single by Oscar was a great mod single which was released by Robert Stigwood's label, Reaction Records. The song got a lot of hype in the press and an ad promoting the single was even featured on the cover of the new Musical Express. Oscar's real name was Paul Buzelink. Later in the 70s, he changed his name to Paul Nicholas and became a well-known actor in Britain. Nicholas even played the role of cousin Kevin in the film Tommy. It won't be much fun being blind, deaf and dumb, but I've no one to play with today. Record Mirror wrote, A hunch tip for the 50 this. But there's a massive publicity drive going on round this live-voiced young chap, and the song has repetitive beat and worthwhile lyrics. It puns and pounds with a girly group behind, quite frenzied as it goes on. Oscar's following singles were written by Pete Townsend and David Bowie, but none of the singles he released as Oscar managed to chart. I've got an indication. Indication by the Zombies was an excellent song which saw the group experimenting with Eastern melodies and influences. The track featured quite an unusual structure. It starts off as a powerful pop number, and it ends with a lengthy instrumental which was influenced by Indian music. The single got mixed reviews in the press. Penny Valentine, who was a huge fan of the band and usually always gave them excellent reviews, wasn't impressed by the song. Penny Valentine wrote, People I know are saying that they are very pleased with this because it sounds so modern. But people like me, don't like it. And I hate saying it because I love the zombies dearly, and I think that they are clever and talented people. This is rather tuneless, something I never thought I'd accuse them of. And somehow rather meandering. The end half where they go madly Arabic and completely potty is most interesting. The B-side was an excellent melancholic pop number called How We Were Before. Again, how we were before. The single, just like so many excellent singles by the Zombies, failed to chart. One by one my friends are leaving town but I just think I'll stop and look around. The Tremolos are usually regarded as a blatantly commercial pop band aimed at teeny boppers. But many of their B-sides prove that the band was hipper than their top sides would lead you to believe. Those of you who are interested in this unknown side of the group should definitely check out this compilation. This single was the first Tremolos 45 without lead singer Brian Poole, who left the band to start a solo career but ended up going into business as a butcher due to lack of success. The A-side was a cover of Blessed by Paul Simon. But the highlight here was the B-side. The Right Time was a fantastic song which sounded like a mix between The Birds and Bob Dylan. The song also featured a memorable chorus and it seems to me that this tune would probably have been a better choice as the top side. The single failed to chart, and so did their following disc, a cover of the Beatles' Good Day Sunshine. 
but their last single of 1966, Here Comes My Baby, was the start of a period of enormous success for the band. Between 1967 and 1974, the band scored 13 top 40 hits in Britain. I hope you enjoyed this trip back to June 1966. See you next time.